So for those of you coming in, uh, we're just going to pause for a moment while Zoom sort of populates the participant list here. Uh, so we will be right with you with the program. Okay, I'm going to get started um, so that we can keep ourselves on track here um, uh, for timing as people continue to come in and uh, populate uh, the room here. Um, my name is Lindsay Craig. I'm the president of National Review Institute, and this is just so wonderful for us to be able to co-sponsor this forum uh, here today with the Lincoln Network, uh, with whom we've really enjoyed partnering. So thank you. Thank you to uh, Jessica and to Marshall. You guys have been great to work with and we really appreciate uh, being able to do this partnership. And it's great to see that there are so many of you uh, who are involved with this great group. Uh, we appreciate uh, joining with a variety of organizations representing diverse perspective because really this is in our DNA, right? Uh, William F. Buckley Jr., our founder, had a very special ability to bring people together. As you know, the movement that he founded was really rich and it was diverse. Don't ever let anyone tell you that it wasn't. He represented a really wide spectrum of those on the right, from the traditionalists to the free market libertarians, and getting rid of some of the others that we didn't think were really part of the movement. Um, over the years, National Review has represented and promoted, both in theory and in practice, fusionism, and bringing together those who have much more in common than they do not to defend and advance the shared principles necessary for a free and prosperous society. And this is really a vital component of the National Review mission. And it is one, as I hope that you know, that we adhere to today. It was yesterday, today, and it will be again tomorrow. We are not deviating from our core mission, no matter what the world around us is saying. And we know that our movement here is stronger and our ideas will win when we stand together rather than apart and siloed. So we so appreciate being able to have this forum with you all today. Of course, you all are familiar with National Review, which remains the highest circulation conservative publication. But you may not be as familiar with National Review Institute, and as we're welcoming new people here today, I just want to take a moment to describe us. Uh, we're the nonprofit organization established to support the mission of the magazine. And our core objective at NRI is to preserve and promote the legacy of William F. Buckley Jr. This means that we advocate strongly and unequivocally for free speech, as you'll hear today, religious liberty, defense of Western civilization, a strong national defense, and limited government for the best opportunities for human flourishing. As of 2015, uh, National Review Magazine and the online publication is now a wholly owned subsidiary of National Review Institute, the nonprofit. And this structure has allowed us a much closer working relationship while still remaining two distinct organizations. NRI supports some of the top talent at National Review, including our own Kevin Williamson here today, um, and create programs to bring them to you, like this forum. We are expanding our programs that bring other aspects of Bill Buckley's legacy to millions of Americans who really, whether they are familiar with Bill Buckley's work or not, have been touched by the conservative principles he championed and the movement he spearheaded. And so we are so pleased to be able to continue this work with the support of so many of you. So now let me introduce uh, Marshall and Kevin today. Um, quickly on Marshall, I want to say that uh, we are fortunate that he actually used to be right in our office when we actually had an office that we went to. Marshall was there every once in a while. Uh, he worked on a, a project uh, for us while, while he was also working on uh, PBS's new Firing Line show with Margaret Hoover. Uh, this was funded through the Public Interest Fellowship and we so appreciate that opportunity to have, have met Marshall at that time. Uh, he is now though currently the Director of Outreach and Media for the Lincoln Network 
and he is a media fellow at the Hudson Institute. Um, and he now lives in Washington, DC in his apartment where he probably okay. doesn't leave. Um, and then for our own uh, Kevin Williamson, um, he is a, as I said, fellow at the National Review Institute and he is National Review's roving correspondent. I hope that all of you are getting his new weekly newsletter called The Tuesday, which comes out on Tuesdays. And uh, I think it's a great name. It's one that he said will keep him on his deadline, which I think is written uh, or stated as a, a, a true newspaper man. Um, he has quite an extensive career in journalism that stretched from Bombay to Texas and Pennsylvania and Colorado. We are so pleased that Kevin is uh, with National Review Institute and National Review. He is by far one of our better writers. And I think that he is somebody who approaches all of his work with a new and crisp uh, look at something and is able to, in almost every piece, as Rich Lowry says, make you think about something in a slightly different way. And that is really a great role for a journalist. Um, so, so Kevin is really one of, one of the best out there. So without further ado, I'm going to ch change this over to, to Marshall so that he can start the conversation. And again, I just wanna thank everybody who was involved in putting this forum on um, and all of the you who are participating in it today. Thanks, Lindsay. So just a quick, quick, quick brief word about the Lincoln Network where I work. I'm the director of Outreach and Media. And the way to think about what we do is we're really interested in exploring the sort of intersection between Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. So I'm based out of D.C., but we also have folks out in Silicon Valley. And our broad thesis about the world as we look at a lot of the problems in American society today, they really come down to this conflict between tech and government. And we sort of see this in a bunch of these different areas, um, especially though. Um, free speech. So to start this off, Kevin, I'm going to ask the most obvious question that we could start with, but almost a year ago, uh, I think we were a little less than your actual release date, you wrote a book, The Smallest Minority, Independent Thinking in the Age of Mob Politics. Obviously, it's about these sort of Twitter dynamics and free speech, um, you know, various publications. What has changed or hasn't changed in your thinking in basically the year since that came out because it feels like it's been 10 years since mm -hmm. uh, everything's been so compressed. Uh, it's, it's really hard being right about things all the time, you know. <laughs> uh, no, things have gotten in many ways uh, worse on that front. Part of that has to do with this being presidential election year. Part of it has to do with the particular nature of politics touching the presidency, but also other issues to this particular point in time. So. We're in a period that would be, I think, pretty bitter and polarized and, and nasty, irrespective of what was going on on social media, if there were no such thing as social media. But we do have such a thing as social media, which I think tends to not so much distort the conversation as amplify the problems that are already there. Um, like that motorcycle outside just got amplified, I'm sure, for all of your uh, listening pleasures. So, um, for instance, the, um, the flight away from kind of um, intelligent, well-informed, respectful, uh, deep discourse is something that was going on for a long time before there was any such thing as social media. It's something that would be happening irrespective if there were a Twitter or a Facebook or not. These can uh, amplify underlying tendencies and they can connect people in a more direct way which sometimes makes people less thoughtful and more likely to uh, treat people in a way they wouldn't if they had a real relationship with them. But it's a, there's broader changes in the culture than that. You know, you were involved in the, uh, in the relaunch of Firing Line. If you, if you wanted to take the actual Firing Line, the original Firing Line, to a production company today and try to sell that to them, you wouldn't get in the front door. You know, we've got some pointy-headed New York intellectual with a very funny accent, and he's going to talk to people for two hours about you know what's going on in uh, Korea, and people would just say you know no. I mean get get the guy a Twitter account and, uh, and see what happens. So we've got shortening attention spans. We've got an increasing sense of tribalism in politics, which I think is what really drives this. Where you've got um, decline in religious life, church attendance, those sorts of things. People turn to this kind of really cheap and dumb form of partisanship as a source of identity and meaning and to uh, connect with people. It's a kind of uh, performative moral theater, which is why you get all this you know, denunciation and, and that sort of thing. So you don't normally in the real world 
get two people who are so angry at one another that they want to fire each other from their jobs because one of them thinks the top tax rate should be 39% and the other one thinks it should be 34.5%. Um, but that's not where we are. We're having these you know, crazy conversations about literally whether peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are racist, and uh, which is a thing that came up uh, that I wrote about a while back. Are they or aren't they? We should get an answer on that. <laughs> uh, well, the, uh, the position of a particular school district in California seems to be that they probably are. Um, in the sense that uh, using this as an example is a bad thing because there's some people who don't uh, have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in their culture and uh, this makes them feel excluded. So there we, there we have that. Um, so it's funny because we're, at the one hand we are having a conversation at that level of trivia and insipidness and stupidity. On the other hand the conversation is much bigger and more involved than it used to be. Um, you know, 50 years ago, people did not um, have the same level of direct participation in political discourse as they do now, thanks to things like social media, but also thanks to um, the way talk radio and certain cable networks have also become a kind of tribal identity. You know, you're not just a conservative, you're a Fox News kind of person, and it's not necessarily the same thing, but they've got, you know, some overlap and a kind of cultural style in common. So we've got more people participating in something that's worth less and less um, as each day goes by. We shouldn't actually be all that surprising because the participation of more people was never actually going to improve the conversation in any, uh, in any meaningful way. You know, I, I, I believe in the democratic principle of one man, one vote, but that's about as far as it goes. Uh, most people don't really have much interesting or insightful to say about almost anything. They've got lives they're busy with. I don't know very much about uh, these things and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that and there's no reason to um, judge people harshly for not making public policy their first area of concern in life unless that's their business but um, if you're not really interested in ideas you're not really interested in policy but you want to have six or seven hours a day a conversation about politics you end up talking about whether peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are racist so there's there's actually a lot there that I want to unpack. I think I want to start with this idea of whether adding people to conversations actually can or can't improve that conversation. Because you know, referencing the original firing line, right? That's in the 1960s. Back in the 60s, though, there were only basically four television stations, right? ABC, NBC, CBS, the predecessor to PBS, which is what Firing Line originally aired on. Of those four categories, the right and basically anything of conservatism wasn't really present. That's what made Firing Line so unique. So do you think, though, that it's possible that something social media does is it enables perspective? So like, let's forget the sheer number of people. It, it can let in perspectives that don't really have an ability to speak. In my last part, if you sort of see this on Facebook, the content that tends to do best on Facebook is conservative content, right? Candace Owens is getting 72 million views on Facebook. Compare that to whatever CNN is putting up. Um, same thing would probably be true on Twitter and other platforms. So I'm curious what you think about that dynamic with social media. Yeah, it's interesting. So conservatives spent a lot of the second half of the 20th century building new institutions, building you know, kind of counter institutions. National Review was one of them. Um, Fox News ended up being one of them. Talk Radio was another. And we hit our greatest success at that institution building right about the time where the institutions stop to matter as much as they used to. So as you're uh, pointing out, you know, once upon a time, there were like three or four voices in print journalism. Uh, there was the Associated Press, uh, there was the New York Times, there was the Washington Post, there was the Wall Street Journal. And you know, if you were like me and you were growing up in a place like Lubbock, Texas, uh, your national news, your international news, what was going on in the economy, what was going on in Washington came to you from the Associated Press or came to you from rewritten copy from one of those other uh, outlets. So, you know, for a conservative to break into one of those uh, places or a conservative idea to get a fair hearing in one of those places was a pretty big deal. And the fact that conservatives couldn't get a fair hearing in most of those outlets uh, for a long time was, of course, why we built National Review and, and other things like that. But, you know, I'm, I look at these things now and I look at the effort to build a business like Vox, for instance. I kind of understand what they're doing over there. I started a newspaper once myself. It's a dumb, dumb thing to do, by the way. It's a good way to lose a lot of money. Um, but, you know, if I were, if you're Maureen Dowd and it's 1984, you kind of understand what the New York Times is bringing to the table as an institution. Um, that's how you get in front of people. That's where the shelf space is. And uh, being in the Times kind of means something in a way 
that not being in the Times uh, doesn't. I'm not sure that's really still the case anymore. I mean, if you think about it just in straight up product terms of, you know, the writers and commentators and ideas being the product and these institutions being the shelf space, that shelf space is a lot less valuable than it used to be. Um, there are ways to get stuff out other than the New York Times. There are ways to get stuff out other than Vox. There are ways to get stuff out other than National Review. And um, so the question you have to ask yourself, I think, if you're the New York Times or National Review or ABC or something else, and also if you're Twitter or Facebook or an account on Twitter and Facebook, is what's the actual value you're bringing to the conversation? And I think this is where these social media mobs have really um, revealed a great deal of hollowness in these mighty, mighty institutions where, you know, the Atlantic and the New York Times and ABC and all sorts of people can be buffaloed into making programming decisions, apparently. Um, apparently in response to things that are going on on social media, although in reality and things that are going on in their own staff. You know, most of this stuff is in-house headhunting. Uh, James Bennett didn't get fired from New York Times because people were mad at him on Twitter. I didn't get fired from The Atlantic because people uh, were criticizing me on Twitter. It was, you know, people inside the institutions. So you've got these institutions. The New York Times, I think, for a long time was looking like it was going to be the one that really stood up to this. You know, there were a lot of campaigns to get her, Barry Weiss, and Brett Stevens, and other people like that. And the Times for a long time kind of more or less said, you know what, we're the New York Times. Um, we're going to hire who we want and publish who we want, and we're going to do things our own way. But even they seem to be knuckling under, and I think that has more to do with internal criticism than with external pressure. Um, but that being the case, so what's the value they really bring to the table? You know, it's no longer where they can say, well, you know that this is reliable, respectable uh, news that you can be confident in because it's the New York Times. We've got this brand and this, um, you know, this means of sorting through content. I don't really think that's uh, the case anymore, partly because they've got longstanding bias problems that people started to understand, partly because they've abandoned their standards. Um, you know, no respectable newspaper would publish the junk Paul Krugman publishes, irrespective of your political views. It's just bad journalism. Uh, that Gail Collins column about Little Sisters of the Poor the other day was just an amazingly bad piece of journalism that shouldn't have, you know, been in the student newspaper of the University of Texas, uh, much less the New York Times. But um, so they're no longer really employing their own standards all that much and enforcing their own standards. But then also these voices, you know, your Krugmans and people like that are independent voices. They can do their own thing on social media where there's no editing, there's no quality control, nothing like that. So um, we care a lot still about what these newspapers say because they do have some influence, but I think they're really, and I hate to say this because I love newspapers and I'm a, you know, I'm a New York Times subscriber, but I think they're really in decline, not as businesses. They're actually doing reasonably well as businesses, but they're in decline as social institutions because they no longer enjoy public confidence and they no longer enjoy public confidence because they no longer deserve to. And that, that brings up the obvious, so I, I think I saw a question about this, the obvious sort of Barry Weiss example, and to mm -hmm. add a little color to it. Um, so not just sort of commenting on her situation, but do you think the project of a paper of record, and I'm sort of, this is a leading question, right, but the, sort of the idea of a paper of record that has a variety of opinions across an ideological spectrum, is that project sort of doomed in a world where everyone's just trying to get subscribers, right? So the question is, and because the thing that's interesting, right, is that if Barry Weiss, you know, gets a lot of clicks, but that ticks off the core subscriber base for a variety of reasons, that could actually be bad versus, you know, 10 years ago, that might not necessarily been true. So how do you think we should think about the phenomenon of Barry Weiss's um, leaving the times in the broader structure of this media conversation? Yeah, I think that um, being something like what the New York Times used to aspire to be, which is a, a, a newspaper of record that has general credibility, that is kind of a, a shared public forum where all sorts of um, different ideas can get a fair and, uh, and open hearing. I think it's actually a pretty good business model because we have such a large market and the costs of transmission for a digital product are so low um, compared to the way where it was for print products back in the you know, 20th century and the, and the turn of the century that you know, in a country of 325 million people, getting a million subscribers to something shouldn't really be all that hard. And you can build a really enormous profitable digital operation with a million paying subscribers uh, on something. Uh, you know, you should be able to get three or four million probably. And I, I don't know what the New York Times is up to, but they're doing actually a reasonably good job of that, as is the Atlantic, as is uh, National Review. So 
in a sense, you know, newspapers went through a really hard time at the turn of the century because of internal business stuff I won't go into, but the industry was really very, very heavily leveraged. There'd been a lot of consolidation, bad business decisions. They weren't prepared for the internet and the lost classified advertising revenue. So they got you know, hit pretty hard and there was a lot of sorting out and shaking up going on. But now they're finding that they have been liberated from this enormous cost they used to incur of printing and distributing newspapers, which uh, when I was in the newspaper business, you know, that was 60, 65% of our expenses. Um, in some operations, it was you know, probably more like 80% of our expenses. So just getting content and getting it edited and getting it to people in a uh, digital form is relatively economically efficient. So if anything, this you know, new model of media that we developed in the wake of the old newspapers and radio stations and TV networks and whatnot ought to be, uh, you know, it's more flexible. It's got lower, you know, built-in physical costs. It's uh, easier to, um, you know, have people work remotely, all those sorts of things. So it's got a lot of advantages built into it. If anything, the quality of our commentary and our journalism ought to be going up uh, because there are a lot of economic incentives for it to be. I don't really think it entirely is. Um, I mean, it's been very good for consumers because we have a lot of choices now. It's a lot easier to get hold of things than you used to. Like, um, you know, I used to live in India. When I lived in India, I really liked reading uh, not only Indian newspapers, but the British newspapers. But, you know, if you're living in Texas in the 1990s, you really can't go down the street and buy a copy of the Times, the London, and the Guardian. Uh, there's not many places you can do that, but now, of course, you can get those things pretty easily. So there's more competition. Um, which I suppose makes uh, things complicated for some people. But there's a disconnect between the level of opportunity there that's presented not only by digital media, but also by social media, by Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it, and, and what's actually being realized, I think. So th this leads into the obvious, another obvious question of the bigger bias issue, right? So if we're looking at the, the, the topic that, you know, the, sort of the, the idea that unifies the conversation about social media platforms, tech companies, the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, is this idea that these mediums, 20th century and 21st century iterations, are biased against the right. Mm -hmm. um, how should conservatives think about that issue? Because, you know, we're going to get into this when you were talking before. Uh, there's a response to this where it's, you know, launch your own counter institutions, right? So that's the second half of the 20th century point you made. I think it's pretty easy to argue that that has not been a success by any standard of, you know, uh, from, a, from a metrics perspective. So how should we think about that project going into the 2020s? Yeah, I think that um, it was necessary for a time for organized conservatism to be a kind of self-conscious counterculture. You know, you're a conservative that is kind of who you are. It's, uh, it informs a lot of how you look at the world. It's not the entirety of your personal identity but it's uh, you know it's a tribe that you belong to, and that became a lot more attractive to people over time, especially as institutions like National Review and Fox News and Talk Radio um, made it possible for that self-conscious counterculture to also be a career. It was something you could do for a living. You could get involved in this kind of commentary. There were institutions that would employ you. There was a speaking circuit and book publishing and, and radio and all the rest of it. And um, that was effective up to a point, but it's much more effective and for us ultimately more necessary for us to not be a separate self-conscious counterculture, but part of the culture itself. Uh, you know, it's much more uh, important to have conservatives and uh, people who are at least open to ideas and open to treating ideas in a, in a fair and intelligent way. Working in the news section at the New York Times, or in the new section of the Associated Press than it is to have you know, one more person with a right-wing talk radio show or one more person with a, with a Fox News program. It's important to have people who are conservative or at least open to, again, dealing intelligently with political ideas who are teachers, not teaching about conservatism or teaching you know, at the Burke Center here or the uh, Milton Friedman Center there, or the Hayek Center there, as important as all those things are, but just saying, well, I'm a professor of English at Princeton and um, I've got these particular, you know, views and affiliations and way of looking at the world. What I teach is Victorian literature, um, but like everyone else, I've got a particular point of view, a particular set of values, and these institutions are at least no longer, you know, entirely hostile to those. That would be an enormous step forward. Of course, we're not really quite entirely there yet. 
So it's important for conservatives to be able to participate in the conversation, but not just as conservatives, um, you know, as people who are policy analysts or people who are members of Congress or people who are academics or whatever. You know, I used to do um, the show Barber Shop on NPR a lot. And it was fun. They're always very nice to me. But I was kind of, you know, they were Jane Goodall and I was the chimpanzee. And they're like, well, look, he, he looks almost like one of us, the way he uses tools and things. And there's this sort of, you know, weird kind of uh, exoticism. So I wasn't just there to talk about what was going on. I was there to be the conservative. And uh, that's unfortunately, I think, as far as we've come in a lot of venues, but partly that's because of limitations we're putting on ourselves, uh, because we now have such a strong tribal sense of conservatism. Um, I worry that conservatism is kind of uh, congealing into an ideology and congealing into a different kind of tribalism. And uh, I think last four years, particularly since the election of Trump, we've seen a lot of that. That's particularly evident in the social media conversation, uh, but it's also evident in uh, you know Fox News and talk radio, where these kind of weird shorthand signifiers, you know, like deep state and establishment and that kind of thing. And it's really it's amazing how we talk about this stuff. Um, I've told this story before, but I was I was at a dinner um, hosted by a famous conservative media figure, and there was a guy there who was the chairman of one of the state Republican parties. And he was talking about how much the establishment hates him and he's anti-establishment and all that. Sense. You're the chairman of the party. You're the establishment. I mean, you can't, you can't be anti-establishment. But it's, um, it's how we talk about these things. And it's this you know, kind of raw, raw uh, team sport version of it. Isn't that, isn't that how you see things? Yeah. And, and I actually, so what, what's, I think this is where this debate gets interesting because I actually completely agree with you on what conservatives should be doing, right? Conservatives should exist, right? Like, I, I think the instinct to sort of say that we're the conservative version of the New York Times, we're the this, this, the that, it's a losing one and it's sort of inherently ghettoizing. But that being said, right, to sort of, and this isn't the perspective I share, but to sort of um, audience advocate, there are people that say, oh yeah, I wish I could just exist in the culture as a conservative, but they will not let me, right? You know, I'm a conservative and I get shadow banned on Twitter. I'm a conservative and or even like a center right person at a place like the New York Times and I get hounded out of the publication, right? So this is where the conversation then quickly trends to um, something you've expressed a deep skepticism of the idea of regulation or sort of using the power of the state to push back against that thing. But the sort of logic becomes, well, if we've lost, you know, the popular culture, and I think this is really something that sort of um, is assumed after the fight over gay marriage ended in defeat. If you've lost popular culture, if business is woke to a degree that's unfathomable, but at the same time, business is then rewarded, right? Nike's stock went up after the Colin Kaepernick ad. If all these things are true, it seems that the only sort of avenue is saying, hey, big tech, if you, conser if you are aggressive against conservatives, we're going to censor you. Hey, media, you know, like if you are going to be biased against us, you know, there are various things you can sort of do there. So how should people who are frustrated in the, the direction I just indicated, how should they respond? And why do you advocate against the sort of using the state regulatory argument? Yeah, I don't think that um, the sort of regulatory uh, proposals that have been made vis-a-vis -vis the social media companies are simply likely to produce the kinds of uh, outcomes that conservatives want. And um, conservatives should always keep in mind that if you create a new regulatory power and a new regulatory apparatus, it's going to be staffed with people. And over time, those are probably not going to be our people. Um, and also, do we really want a government where getting the policy outcomes we want requires us to stack the bureaucracies with ideological allies? Um, that's just you know, not, I think, a, a good recipe for a, a free society. Um, and these companies are very large and very complex, and the political conversation is only a relatively small part of what most of them do. Um, you know, even as much as we all notice the politics and junk on uh, Facebook, uh, political conversation is a relatively small part of what Facebook does, uh, in the same sense that you know, journalism and political journalism is a relatively small sense of what you know, media conglomerates like the ones that operate NBC do. So um, we should be modest in our expectations. And we should not use the tools that are not the appropriate tools for the job. 
So if you want to, you know, trot out, say, antitrust legislation or antitrust powers, you should be doing that because you think there's an antitrust problem in the market, not because you want to punish Facebook or Twitter for its advertising policies or for its free speech policies. Um, that being said, um, I think there are two separate things here that should be uh, looked at separately. One is that um, we spend a lot of time talking about people like Barry Wise or me or people like that who are in the commentary business, who are kind of in the controversy business, um, not exactly celebrities, but um, public figures. And um, I don't think we should worry about us that much. I mean, yes, it is bad for the New York Times that they can't keep um, someone like Barry Wise on staff. It is bad for the Atlantic that they can't figure out a way to keep someone like me on staff. But the real problem is that you can't be a bank branch manager, you know, and have the uh, wrong kind of uh, political views. Um, you can't, there's a lady in, I want to say it's Seattle, who's just, you know, been uh, just bullied in submission because she was, a, she was an older white woman who wore dreadlocks. And this became, you know, a cultural appropriation thing. She was a, you know, Black Lives Matter supporting lefty, Seattle progressive type person who's you know being denounced as a racist and a white supremacist and this kind of stuff because she's wearing a dopey hairstyle that you know uh, that certain people have been wearing. I guess you know, when did white people start doing dreadlocks? Really, the '90s, I guess. Then it was kind of a late punk rock thing. And um, <clears throat> you know, we treat these things like they're um, life and death matters, where people are literally losing jobs in fast food restaurants and Starbucks and things like that because employment is being used as the principal weapon of enforcing political and social conformism and homogeneity. And I think it's a very, very different thing for people to fight with a columnist or to fight with a, an elected official or a public figure than it is to say, and this is a true story, you know, the uh, Covington Catholic thing, you had a kid who was photographed doing something people thought was wrong, although it turns out that he wasn't actually doing anything wrong. Then there was another kid in the picture, like 40 feet away, and his mother was employed by some company back home, wherever they were from, Kentucky. And someone, you know, tracked down, who's the mother of this kid who's in the picture with the other kid that we think are doing something bad? How can we get her fired from her job? Normal people don't do stuff like that, and a normal, healthy society doesn't do things like that. And that kind of, you know, East German informant uh, kind of culture that we're building for ourselves is to me far, far more terrifying and a much greater consequence than things that happen to, you know, professional controversialists. So, so I have two last questions before we transition to the audience questions section. Um, following up on what you just said, I want to tie this back to something you said at the beginning of the call. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you sort of um, suggested that it's not as if these social platforms are causing new behaviors, they're surfacing things that are sort of there. The, the, the pushback on this, and I just know that there are people on the right and sort of uh, legislative reg regulatory circles who push this thing is that actually no, Twitter does create behaviors. So for example, um, Twitter, because of the way it's designed, it's you know optimized around promoting engagement, right? Twitter sells advertising, Facebook sells advertising. So what it does is it actually creates the situation where Twitter makes more money when you get a social media mob attacking that parent, right? Sure. So the, the question is, why is that happening? Well, part of the reason why it's happening is because that's Twitter's business model. Um, so part of the pushback is, well, we actually, from a governing perspective or from a regulatory perspective, could make decisions or even on the private sector side, we could create companies or we can make investment decisions that could shape that. So for example, Twitter is recently exploring the idea of a subscription model, um, introducing a subscription product in addition to the advertising, and that would change the incentives. So how should we think about what are behaviors that exist and what are things that are created by algorithms and business model incentives? Yeah, well, again, I think what those things really principally do is amplify things that are already going on. So the um, desire for people to belong to a team, to treat the other side as, you know, infidels and heretics, to engage in you know, ritual denunciations, to uh, displace their own personal private anxieties and unhappiness onto the political or public sphere is um, something that's been with us for a long time. And the commercial aspects of that are something that's been with us for a long time, too. Um, it's always been the case that, um, you know, highly angry partisan journalism um, 
enjoys a pretty strong market and are even angry nonpartisan journalism. You know, the National Enquirer for a long time used to publish this column that was probably written by 10 or 12 different people, but the byline was Ed Anger. And uh, he was just, you know, mad about something that way. And it was enormously popular. And um, so anyone who's ever written a book or given a speech or uh, been a guest on a radio or a television show knows that the audience you get if you come in and, uh, you know, sort of yell and scream and point fingers and engage in this very theatrical kind of behavior is almost always larger than the one you get um, otherwise. Uh, you know, I used to do Fox News a lot and they just really hated having me on because, you know, I would give these sort of, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, answers. They're like, no, go, go strangle the guy. That's what we want. And, um, and that wasn't because they're right wing and they wanted to hurt some left wing person for the same reason that it's not the other way around on MSNBC. It's because that keeps people watching television. So those underlying cultural and psychological issues that make Twitter such a sewer, and it is a sewer, um, are there in other media too. They're there in print journalism, they're there in book writing, they're there in theater. Um, Twitter makes them more immediate and it makes them easier to access. So by providing immediate intimate connections between vast bodies of people, it helps us stay in very close touch with the vulgarity and stupidity of the masses. So last question. Um, so then after all this conversation, then what is the takeaway for anyone who wants to sort of um, preserve free speech in the new public square, which is the, where it's broader next to the internet and everything? Yeah, um, I think the best that you can do is, um, you know, subscribe to and support uh, publications and businesses that you think do things well. Uh, criticize the ones that don't. Um, don't be part of that culture yourself, certainly if you can avoid it. I don't really think that social media contributes very much to people's lives. You know, I haven't used it for a couple of years now myself, and I find that I haven't missed it. And even though I have a commercial interest in, you know, getting my name out there, it doesn't really seem to have affected that very much either. So I think we overestimate how important this stuff is because it feels very emotionally important. Because we as human beings are very, very strongly programmed to respond to personal criticism. So if someone comes out and says, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're dishonest, you're lazy, whatever, even we know it's not true, even if the criticism is coming from someone we don't know or care about, or even if it's someone we actively hold in low esteem, we respond to that stuff very strongly. And uh, we also respond to the opposite very strongly, to uh, praise and enthusiasm and encouragement, even when it's coming from people it shouldn't come from that we shouldn't take seriously. And the genius really of, of Zuckerberg and Facebook was simply putting a number on people's friends count and publishing it. And <laughs> because that really plays to and amplifies the kind of anxiety that sends people to social media in the first place where they're not looking for information, they're looking for interaction and connections. You know, you don't go to Twitter to learn about what's going on in the world. You go to Twitter to engage in this kind of weird group therapy session that social media provides. Of course. So now, um, thank you, Kevin. Um, this is really great. So now I'm going to transition it um, to NRI that will handle the Q&A so everyone could keep putting those up there. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jason Wise here, Regional Development Officer for NRI based in Seattle. Um, Kevin, kind of picking up on your last comment, do you see the downfall or unliking of social media in the near future due to some combination of boredom, navel gazing, increasing negativity, and increased tribalism? Yeah, all those things, I think. Yeah, I think people will and are getting bored with it. I think that um, social media doesn't actually provide to people in the long term the thing they're they're looking for, which is connection and meaning and meaningful interaction. So it provides a kind of some simulacrum of that stuff. Um, but that charge wears off for people. And, and there's some um, there's some uh, evidence on that internally from the companies themselves where they can look at you know, users' uh, engagement careers, and they do tend to uh, often drop off at certain points. So um, particularly for the least angry uh, people, more angry people tend to be more committed to it, but people who have low uh, anger profiles often tend to drop off after a few months or years of engagement. Uh, competition certainly will um, 
have something to do with that too, where people go to other places to get the things that they think they're getting from Facebook or Twitter or even, you know, YouTube or, or Google and companies like that. And um, the negativity, I don't think, will play into it because I think the negativity really is its selling point. You know, people are looking for, they're looking for a theater for anger. And that's what Twitter really is and Facebook really is. Anger makes people feel like they are engaged and morally serious and that what they're saying has some special value because it's being said with this great emotional conviction. So it's the performance of importance that starts to feel to people like importance itself. And uh, so whatever you know, ends up displacing this stuff, I would expect to see a lot of that same kind of negativity and rage in it because that's really essentially what drives this stuff. It's, um, you know, the social media market is not based on the desire for information. It's based on anxiety and loneliness. And those are its real fundamental dynamic drivers. Got a question coming from Charles Rodriguez. When social media content becomes personal attacks and outright lies, at which point is fit to print or not? What is your take on labeling slanderous or fact incorrect content while preserving freedom of expression? Well, I'd actually be interested to hear what Marshall has to say about this, but I think that American libel law is actually pretty good. Um, you know, it's you can win a slander case, a libel case against someone if you've really got one, if they've said something that's false and defamatory and was said with actual malice or reckless disregard for the truth, which is our general standard. Uh, one of the problems with social media is the norm of anonymity. And uh, <clears throat> you know, these rage mob politics are, if anything, making that worse, of course, because um, there's a really strong reason to want to remain anonymous on social media now. Because even things you write or say in good faith and with good intention might a year from now be something that causes you to lose your job. So um, it's very difficult to, uh, to prosecute a libel lawsuit against someone who is an anonymous Twitter user. Um, Twitter can give you some information to help track that stuff down. Um, I've actually was involved in a lawsuit, but involved in something that required me to track someone down on Twitter uh, for similar reasons uh, some time ago. But it's a very expensive and cumbrous thing to have to do. I think that if somebody really wanted to come up with a good competitor to one of those, to Twitter or to Facebook, um, I would make a service that didn't actually have any anonymity. Uh, there's no anonymity at all. Everyone's on the record. Everyone's using their own names. And see if that doesn't produce some um, better and more respectful content in exchange, although it would limit severely, I think, the size of the potential market. Yeah, I'll jump in on that real quick. Um, thanks, Kevin. Um, I think this is, and this is where the debate about how our government structure things is relevant because, um, and I don't advocate repealing Section 230, but you know, this is where sort of the regulatory policy comes in because there's this, um, there's this law, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, which basically says that Twitter and Facebook aren't responsible for things that people post on their site. So Facebook's responsible for what Facebook posts, but if I want to get on Facebook right now and slander or engage in libel against Kevin because I'm angry at some response he gave, that's not Facebook's responsibility. So that whole debate over libel and slander and how those are actually engaged, that's actually deeply intertwined with debates about the role the state plays in this because that's something that hypothetically you could remove Section 230 and platforms sure. could hypothetically be liable for the content that's on there, and then that would play a role in shaping the way the contents, the way the platforms were designed. So, for example, you know, if we're talking about anonymity being a bad thing, well, if Twitter has to worry about slanderous comments, maybe they would make that removing 230 would get would incentivize them to um, change that. Now, I just want to say I don't support repealing 230, but then to the other thing, um, the fact checking issue. I think fact checking is a, is a really dangerous area, and I think it's an area where conservatives are very happy with, I think, Mark Zuckerberg's rhetoric on this topic with his deep sort of skepticism of the idea of some of the objective truth when it comes to most, most of these issues. Um, because I think too often what you find fact checking descends into as well. Kevin said X, but you know, I have this think tank study that says Y, so that's really incorrect. If you actually delve into, because the thing is that the fact checking debates are never about the obvious. So debates on Facebook are never about like, I claim the sky is red. 
Kevin says it's blue and then someone fact checks. That's, that's not the problem. The problem is always in the sort of gray zones where I don't trust and conservatives shouldn't trust sort of impartial arbiters of determining that. Yeah, the, the fact check stuff is pretty bad. Um, you know, I have a long going kind of feud with the, uh, the pointer people and the political fact people. <laughs> um, years ago, I wrote a piece about the Affordable Care Act when it was being debated. And I noted that it would um, provide certain kinds of recognition and, and in effect subsidies for a lot of pseudoscience, you know, aromatherapy and Reiki and that kind of stuff, mostly having to do with the fact that these are uh, licensed in some states. So PolitiFact did a fact check on this and they labeled my claim mostly false, even though it was obviously true. And I was like, well, it's not a very big part of the bill. I didn't say it was a big part of the bill. I just said it was part of the bill. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you, this kind of, you know, motivated reasoning, motivated fact checking is going to be a problem, whether it's being done by Facebook or whether it's being done by the Washington Post or being done by the pointer people or, um, or other people. You know, an interesting thing about that, I was thinking about the other day, actually, I want to get your view on this. Um, and there's this liable lawsuit going on against, uh, Joy Reid, who, um, wrote something about a woman wearing a MAGA hat and, um, it looks like a pretty straightforward case of defamation to me. She sort of put words in the woman's mouth that she hadn't had, hadn't said. And uh, she you know, presented as she was you know, screaming insults at this kid. And the kid came forward and said, no, that's actually not what happened. She was trying to be nice, but there were other people who were kind of being jerks. So I don't think that you know, you'd want to have a situation where Twitter gets sued over this or Facebook gets sued over this. But I think there's a pretty good case for suing her employers over this in addition to suing her. Because you know, you've got companies like MSNBC that have policies that say we want you using Twitter, here are the rules for engagement, um, you know, link to our content, that sort of thing, where their employees are using these tools to further their corporate missions. I don't think it makes sense necessarily legally to treat, uh, you know, Joy Reid's, uh, am I thinking of the right person, by the way? I get these things confused sometimes. I think I, we could assume it's Joy Reid. Yeah. <laughs> no one's um, checking this talk. <laughs> um, I don't think it necessarily makes sense to treat their Twitter accounts or their Facebook accounts as though they were just private endeavors when they're really part of their work responsibilities and part of the content they produce. And so I think there's a good argument for holding employers to count when you've got someone who works for the New York Times slandering someone on social media or someone who works for MSNBC slandering someone on social media uh, in the same way that you would hold those employers to account if they had done it on their programs or in their, in their columns. So I think maybe there is, um, there is some room for expanding the theater of libel action, I think, legally without worrying about 230 or, you know, doing, I, I think it just doesn't make any sense either legally or, or structurally to treat um, Facebook as a, as a publisher for these sorts of things because they don't review content before it goes out. I mean, that's the whole idea. You've got this unmediated thing. Now, if they were a company that was saying, well, we look at everything and then decide to publish it or not publish it, yeah, then they're a publisher, that makes sense. Um, but what they are is they're more akin to being the company that owns the printing press than they are to being the company that owns the New York Times. I think what's, so I agree with you in the sort of specific scenario you discussed, right, with Joy Reid, uh, where, and, and this actually happens with the New York Times, the New York Times actually has a decently strict social media policy, mm -hmm. and, there, and there are several reporters that will go nameless who routinely violate the letter and the spirit of that policy. Um, but I think the problem that I have, though, is sort of, I don't want to say this is a slippery slope, but sort of like extending that outwards. I see a world where very, very clearly we already have this problem where people go to people's employers to get them fired over these sort of social media moments. I see very clearly a, a, a situation arising where you get groups, you know, Southern Poverty Law Center, ADL, basically going to every major employer demanding they adopt an anti-racist um, you know, uh, social media policy for everyone, right? So it wouldn't stop at the New York Times. This would go from anyone who engages in any sort of public facing, because it's very easy to rationalize that, right? Because, <laughs> and the reason why um, I went to USC of Oregon, so I'm very fluent in sort of social justice discourse, but it's all intersectional, right? So at the same time, like, why should it stop at the New York Times, right? If a bank teller who approves, you know, bank loans and is handing out money to people, if they have, you know, this sort of incident. So I, I think you would very, if in a good faith world, I would support that policy, but in the, but in the bad faith when we live in, I think it would almost certainly rebound to hurt people who hold heterodox viewpoints. Yeah. 
Another thing that I think, I mean, it's unfortunately we're unable to draw fine distinctions really as a culture and a society more so. I think there's a very strong role for institutions to play in, um, in partly policing how people conduct themselves. You know, I don't want, um, I don't want Harvard firing professors because, well, you believe in this idea or you believe in that idea and we think that you can't work at Harvard if you believe this thing or that thing. But I think it makes a lot of sense for, you know, Harvard or the New York Times or National Review to say to people, we expect you to conduct yourself a certain way. Um, you know, we expect you, especially if you're, you know, you, you have a social media account that says, hi, I'm Bob, I'm a Harvard professor, then um, we want you to behave as a matter of etiquette, in a matter of uh, intellectual honesty, in a matter of um, institutional interest, that you behave yourself in a certain kind of way, that you meet certain kinds of intellectual standards. And I think what we've done is we've substituted this kind of cheap moralism, where if you can say, that's racist, um, and that's the end of the conversation. And uh, that's what we're really talking about is this kind of, you know, um, content free, dishonest, bad faith, moralistic policing instead of a larger, um, more open, but much, much more productive, I think, conversation about how do people who are affiliated with institutions conduct themselves as members of those institutions? And um, I think there might actually be some room for, for progress to be made there. You're right, of course, that um, the moment we're in right now is, can we get this person fired because we don't like them? And uh, as long as that's the default cultural position, not only among idiots on Twitter, but you know, among people like Paul Krugman, um, then you're going to have a difficult time having that other more nuanced conversation. Would culture, uh, would cancel culture exist without social media? Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, uh, this is the same kind of thing that was done, for instance, to gay people working in Hollywood in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s and thereafter. And the same rationales were given to you. Like, well, we're not, you know, uh, we're not um, violating anyone's rights. You don't have a right to star in our motion picture. And hey, if the public doesn't want to see it, the public doesn't want to see it. This is how people feel. Um, there are consequences to the choices you make, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's to a certain extent, the same kind of uh, thing that was deployed against, uh, you know, various left wingers and radicals during the uh, Red Scare and McCarthy era and all that. Um, although I think the kind of anti-gay stuff in Hollywood is maybe a a better uh, parallel because it's more, more nearly the same kind of moralistic hysteria. Um, so the cultural instinct has been there for as long as we've been keeping score, I think. But again, this makes things quicker, more immediate, more closely connected. And so it changes the way that that stuff gets amplified and the uh, efficacy of it. You know, it used to take a long time to organize, communicate, 